Saddleworth Moor in the South Pennines. It's where notorious serial killers Ian Brady and Myra Hindley like to come at weekends to play and relax. And it's where they buried their victims. Their horrific crimes, torturing and murdering children, will keep the Moore's murders always in our memories. My name is David Wilson. I'm a criminologist, and I've interviewed and worked with dozens of serial killers. Ian Brady, however, is unique. He tortured his victims and took photographs of the places on these moors where he killed and buried them to keep as macabre trophies. I want to understand Brady's murderous career and how he was capable of committing such appalling cruelty against children. To do so, I need to revisit his crimes and think carefully about what they tell us about Brady the man and the murderer. In this film, I'm going to talk to people who have met and studied Brady. As far as his moral perspective is concerned, he never did anything wrong. And the people who helped put this terrible killer behind bars forever. The thing is, he just didn't take kids, uh, kidnap them, and murder them, they tortured them. Now that Ian Brady is dead, some questions still need to be answered. What made him a murderer? What secrets did he take to the grave? And were there any more victims? Join me as I investigate one of Britain's most iconic serial killers. As a criminologist, I've talked to many murderers and serial killers. They're usually uncommunicative. But Ian Brady is unusual. He speaks out. He's written thousands of letters, both campaigning and personal. And he's the only British serial killer to write a book. Jailed in 1966, he spent the last 25 years in Ashworth High Secure Hospital after being diagnosed as schizophrenic. In 1999, in protest against conditions there, he went on hunger strike and was tube-fed against his will for the rest of his life. Ian Stewart, as he then was, was born in 1938 in the tough Gorbals tenements of Glasgow. His mother was Maggie Stewart, his father unknown. He was cared for by foster parents Mary and John Sloan from an early age. A troubled teenager, age 16, and as a parole condition, he went to live with his natural mother in Manchester. She was by then married to Patrick Brady, an Irish labourer. Ian changed his name again, from Sloan to Brady. Brady thought of himself as intellectual a cut above not just the average offender, but also above everyone else. Not for him a nine-to-five life dominated by work and wages. He wasn't just an ordinary man. He was a superman, at least in his own eyes. Brady started work as a stock clerk at Millward Merchandise, a chemicals company. And in 1961, at the age of 23, he met an 18-year-old secretary, Myra Hindley. In Myra, his willing pupil, he had at last found someone to share and realize his violent and murderous fantasies. It was a meeting that would spark a violent killing partnership, what psychologists call a folie a deux. Chris Cowley, a forensic psychologist, 
met and corresponded with Brady during his lifetime, and I wanted to know what role Hindley played in igniting Brady's murderous instincts. Clearly, the relationship that dominates Brady's life is the relationship that he had with Myra Hindley. So you and I, professionally, might call that a folly a deux, but yes. what does that mean? Well, it's almost like a shared madness. Yeah, you've got two people heading off in a direction which could be potentially dangerous or potentially extremely antisocial, and they kind of hook up together. They reflect off each other. So with Myra Hindley there with him, he could do a lot more than he perhaps would have done on his own. She didn't feel like she was doing anything wrong. He didn't feel like he was doing anything wrong. And together, they, they became a, a horrible pair of monsters. Between July 1963 and December 1964, Brady, with Hindley, a willing accomplice, is known to have raped, tortured, killed, and buried four young victims on the moors. He was caught after the murder of his fifth. Their trial revealed horrors that shocked the British public and still does decades later. It had a phenomenal impact on the public consciousness. It still does today. At the time, the crimes that they committed to kidnap, uh, rape uh, and strangle little children it was almost unprecedented. It was just had a, a, a huge shock. It was in every newspaper, it was in it on every television station. The people were saying, how could a woman, protector of children, how could she be involved with the sexual killing and strangling of, of little, little girls and, and little boys? It was just, I mean, so she was sort of like the epitome of evil. During his many years in prison, Brady corresponded with a chosen few. Chris Cowley was one of them. But he talks about killings in the third person, doesn't he? Yes. He's not communicating directly about what he did with you. He calls it analysis by hypothesis. Analysis by hypothesis. What does he mean by that? Basically, he will describe what somebody might have done in a situation when they're involved with a murder, how the circumstances might have occurred, or how the person might have felt. He, he would never say, I felt like this, yeah, or I did that, or Myra Hindley did that. It was always, well, the girl might have done that, or maybe the man felt this way. And so, and so you have to kind of read between the lines. These murders, referred to so obliquely by him, were no doubt fueled by Brady's sexual fantasies. Fantasies of power, dominance, control. Hindley's involvement had allowed him to fulfill these. But when he tried to recruit another follower to join him in axing to death his fifth victim, it all went wrong for Brady. In shallow graves, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley buried four of the children they murdered in the mid-1960s here on the moors. Their fifth victim was different. On the 6th of October 1965, Brady beat Edward Evans, a 17-year-old engineering apprentice, with an axe before strangling him to death in his living room in front of Myra's brother-in-law, David Smith. Brady had hoped Smith would help him kill and dispose of Evans. However, Smith was terrified and hours later contacted the police. The next day, Brady was arrested, but the police were unaware that they had a brutal serial killer in custody. They arrested his accomplice, Hindley, on the 11th. Four days after arresting Hindley, the police discovered a suitcase belonging to the couple in a Manchester station left luggage locker. It contained nine indecent photographs of a young girl and a 13-minute tape recording of her screaming for help. The police had found the last moments of 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey's life. 
A scribbled name in a notebook at the couple's home was the first clue to the fate of another child reported missing a year before, 12-year-old John Kilbride. And they discovered numerous seemingly innocent photographs of the couple relaxing on the moors, whose chilling significance was only later to come to light. What's interesting to me is how the moors were clearly important to Brady and Hindley, to the extent that they'd want to return to these deposition sites, to have their photographs taken at them as some kind of macabre trophy of the murders that they had committed together. Chris Crowther's family have farmed this bit of the moor since before Brady and Hindley turned it into their killing fields. As a schoolboy, Chris has vivid memories of meeting the photographer and his girlfriend one summer's evening. I was bringing some sheep back with my dad one night. I used to help my dad gather sheep and uh, I just bumped into these. I didn't know who they were, but they were canoodling on a rock. My dad shouted at them to go home. I can remember she's blonde hair and he had long coat on and his starey eyes and he wouldn't speak to me dad. Chris recalled these events sometime later when hundreds of police turned up to search the moors for evidence. There was photographs given to me dad to recognise areas where presumably bodies had been buried. My dad identified the area which he recognised because his dog had been sniffing around the area when he gathered some sheep. They said there could be something down there. New recruit Bob Spears joined in the search, crisscrossing the moors looking for the children's graves. He was to make a horrifying discovery. I wandered away up the tops. In the distance, when you look across, is these reservoirs. And it's silent, quiet, you could hear nothing. As I'm on my way down, I saw a depression in the peat. Just a hollow filled with water. But sticking up out of this water was what I'd later describe as an old withered stick. And I could feel something soft under the water. At the end of an exhausting day of searching, Bob's belief that he had found something initially met some resistance. I was getting nothing but aggravation. It was a uniform sergeant, and he continually went on. I was wasting time. And if there's anything in there, it's a sheep. And as I said, well, if that's a sheep, it's wearing clothes. And at this point, they just moved it and seen this material. Bob's persistence paid off. It was the body of the little girl who had last been seen alive having fun at a fairground in Manchester on Boxing Day 1964. Bob had found the remains of 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey. There had been a gas main put here six months previously, and they'd buried Leslie Ann Downey in the spoil of the gas main. John Kilbride's body was found five days after Leslie Ann's. 12-year-old John had gone missing in October 1963, over a year before Leslie Ann. His shallow grave was discovered just across the road from hers. The police had found the bodies of the two children they knew to be missing. Brady and Hindley both vehemently denied the murders at the committal hearing in October 1965. 
A month later, with nothing else to go on, the police ended their search of the Moors and wouldn't be back for nearly 20 years. Policeman Bob Spears came face to face with the killers when he gave evidence at the Moore's murder trial at Chester Assizes in the spring of 1966. That's when I saw Brady and Hindley across the dock. You looked at them and they just stared across the dock at you. Deep set, staring eyes, evil. The full horror of what they had done, and particularly Hindley's part in the murders, came to light, reaching a crescendo when the recording of poor Leslie Ann Downey's final moments was played. When the tapes were played in court, people were devastated. Hardened policemen were, were bursting in, into tears listening, listening to those tapes. They just didn't take kids, kidnap them. They murdered them, they tortured them. Leslie Ann begging for her life on tape. You'll never know what the wee kid went through. She's calling for her mum. So there's no mercy, they had no mercy. They're just horrible, horrible people. Torturing Leslie Ann recording her pleading for her life, no doubt to play back later, taking photographs of her to look at later, was the couple's way of keeping their fantasies alive after Leslie Ann had been buried on the moors. Hindley claims that she does with nearly all of the killings, that she was in another room, she was running a bath. Brady himself has stated that. Hindley insisted on killing Leslie Ann Downey. You know, she, she, she decided that she wanted to do the murder. It was her turn, and uh, she strangled her with, with a length of cord. And when they found the photographs of Leslie Ann Downey that had been taken in the room where she was killed, in the suitcases that they'd hidden in the left luggage Manchester station, it was Hindley's fingerprints that were all over them, not Brady's. So she'd obviously been looking at them and touching them. The tape and the photographs were the sickening trophies of their joint enterprise. I think there's a huge element of sexual fantasy cropping yeah. up. We've got the incredibly horrific tapes of Leslie Ann Downey, which they were clearly playing to each other. They're sexually experimenting as a folly adder. There was certainly a sexual element in all five killings. As far as Brady was concerned, I don't think that really was the primary motivation. It was more a control thing. Brady felt very powerless. He was in a miserable dead-end job, not much future to look forward to. He likes to think that he had transcended the boring human race. But he said the difference between people like him and the rest of the human race that don't go around murdering um, is, is they lack the will to enact. They haven't got the guts to do it. Ian Brady was convicted of the murders of John Kilbride, Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans. Myra Hindley of the murders of Edward Evans and Leslie Ann Downey and as an accessory to the murder of John Kilbride. Just months before they went to trial, the death penalty had been abolished. So they were sentenced to life imprisonment. He went to Hull Prison, she went to Holloway and the police closed the case. But there were rumours that more children were buried on the moors. And over the next 20 years, newspapers ran stories about other children who'd gone missing when Brady and Hindley had been active. Fred Harrison, a Sunday newspaper journalist, 
wanted to find out if the rumours were true. I was embarrassed by the fact that the newspapers were exploiting the Moors murders for the purposes of selling newspapers, uh, when all the time there were grieving mothers who needed to know where their children were buried. Uh, no effort was actually made to try and help those mothers. Uh, so I felt that if I approached Brady carefully, in the fullness of time, it might be possible to end up achieving a result. Fred contacted Brady, now in Gartree prison, and asked if they could meet. The answer came back, yes. I was told that I couldn't meet him in the visiting room because this man had to be kept apart from the rest of the prison population. So I was shown into the dentist's room and I sat in the dentist chair and he sat in the, at a desk and uh, we had a meeting. He told me about how he liked French cigarettes but had difficulty getting them, which was my cue. So on the second visit, of course, I had a package of French cigarettes and I even smoked one with him, although I'm a non-smoker, just in order to establish a rapport. After 20 years in prison, Brady was dramatically altered. He was doped up much of the time, so he had difficulty talking and being articulate. So on some occasions, he wasn't very forthcoming in the information that he was able to impart just because his mind had been shut down by these pills that they were shoveling into him. Other times, he was very articulate. My job was to try and ease the information out of him by gaining his confidence but knowing that this was going to be a challenge just because his mental state was in turmoil. When Fred felt the time was right to ask about the missing children, Brady made it clear he was willing to talk. But he wanted something in return. He wanted Fred to help him get out of prison and into the mental health system. And he wanted to keep Myra Hindley in jail. For six years after their trial, Hindley and Brady had corresponded in coded letters. But then she stopped writing, and Brady must have felt that he was losing control over the one person he had shaped in his own image. She wanted parole and her freedom. She didn't care anymore. And then she started having um, a series of affairs both with other prisoners and at least one prison guard that we know of for sure. And then she starts representing herself, doesn't she? Yes. She starts very deliberately talking about parole, wanting to show remorse, doing the Open University degree. He became disgusted with her, and so when he started seeing Fred Harrison and trying to work out how he could get himself out of jail or into a mental hospital, that was around about the same time, so that was when he went to the press and basically pinned the blame on, on Hindley. Brady believed he had shielded Hindley from some of the blame in the trial. Now he wanted to make it clear she was an equal partner in the killings. When it became apparent to him that she had betrayed him, he had one purpose in life, and that was to keep her in prison. That was a problem. How could he divulge that she was guilty of the crimes of killing children without talking about the crimes and admitting them himself. I feel that he could see the possibility that he could use me as a means of announcing to the world that she really was guilty. Finally, Fred was about to discover what Brady had kept secret for two decades. But with a killer like Brady, nothing was ever straightforward. There was no one moment at which he confessed, I kill children. It was always oblique references to things that had happened, and I was expected to understand what he was alluding to. I managed to somehow get enough direct confirmation from Brady that there were more children up on the moors. the story exploded across the front pages. Two missing children, long thought to have been potential victims of the pair, Pauline Reed and 12-year-old Keith Bennett, were finally confirmed as such. Brady had confessed to their murder, but wasn't going to tell the police where he'd buried them. 
nor was he going to express any remorse for what he'd done. He knew what he had done was unforgivable, uh, and uh, he, he was not going to seek um, the sympathies of people as a result of him expressing remorse. So he was very explicit that uh, it would have been dishonest of him to have uh, offered such ex public expressions of remorse. But would the police case files, closed for 20 years, give up any further clues that might reveal the final resting places of Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett? Here, on Saddleworth Moor, north of Manchester, the bodies of Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett lay hidden for more than 20 years. Their brutal murders might never have been discovered if reporter Fred Harrison hadn't persuaded Brady to confess. The revelation caused huge public outcry and put pressure on Greater Manchester Police to reopen the investigation. It was led by Detective Chief Superintendent Peter Topping. Detective Inspector Jeff Nupfer worked with him. First job really was to go and find all the original papers, uh, all the original investigators and all the original witnesses uh, and then go and really try and interpret the photography recovered from both the inquiry and from Ian Brady who was an, an avid photographer and quite a competent photographer. He used to do all his own black and white processing as well and really try and make some sense of all this. Brady took hundreds of photographs, mostly of himself and Myra, in scenic locations, many of them on the moors. During the first investigation, the police discovered the couple liked to take pictures of each other standing by their victims' graves. This was the grave of John Colbride. And this, Leslie Ann Downey. Now the police accepted that there were more graves to be found, some wondered how many more bodies these macabre photographs might point to. If we look at these incredible photographs, do you think this implies something about Brady and Hindley being proud of oh, yes. what they did? Oh, they're definitely trophies. I mean, just look at the way they're standing. Look. Big smile on their face, and standing on top of the grave. Big smile on his face, standing on top of the grave. They were literally dancing on the graves of their victims and collecting trophies. It was all the trophies that got them in prison. That was the evidence that we used in court. There was no denying it. There were tape recordings of the little girl being tortured, photographs of her naked in pornographic positions, pictures of them standing on the graves. Six months after his confession to Fred Harrison, Brady left the prison system and was transferred to Ashworth High Secure Hospital in Merseyside after having been diagnosed with schizophrenia. In December 1986, Hindley, who had always denied her involvement in the killings, admitted the five murders, in the hope that a show of remorse would help her win parole. She took the police to locations on the moor to try and find the missing graves. Myra Hindley was a very intelligent woman, very manipulative woman as well, and she had come to this clear decision that she was going to assist. And once she'd made that decision, um, she gave us 150% support. There was no doubt about that at all. And she was not frightened to say things that implicated her in these appalling murders. Hindley went to places she and Brady had gone to when he was, as Brady had phrased it, doing another one. After a hundred days of searching, the police finally found the body of 16-year-old Pauline Reed. They must have given a bit of information to the police and they, they dug on the edge of the peat there and uh, found Pauline shortly afterwards. But where was Keith Bennett's body? Not to be outdone by Hindley, six months later, Brady returned to the moors he had made so infamous. 
the police hoped he would help them locate the 12-year-old's grave. The police searched for six weeks, but found nothing. We knew from Murray Hindley where they'd parked the car on these outings onto Saddleworth Moor, and we walked onto the moor via the same route. So there was clearly a lot of consensus in the accounts. He was difficult to deal with throughout, and I can always remember on one occasion saying words to the effect of uh, who, who's moved that hill, uh, which kind of scuppered it uh, somewhat, you know. The police took Brady back to the moors one last time on the 1st of December, but to no avail. Brady's help gave no peace to Keith Bennett's grieving mother, Winnie Johnson, who longed to give her son a decent burial. I'm reasonably satisfied that when we took him onto the moors on two occasions, he was genuinely trying to get his bearings and point out where uh, Keith was buried. But sadly, uh, it's a very barren uh, place, uh, something of a wilderness, uh, and it's not easy to find someone's bearings, uh, even after a five-year break, never mind a 20 or 30-year break. A number of things strike me being here for the first time. Isn't it interesting that the bodies of the two girls who go missing are found on this side of the road and the body of John Kilbride is on the other side of the road? Is there a perverse logic that we've got to deal with in relation to how Brady and Hindley disposed of the bodies of their child victims? And one criminological reality is this, that serial killers don't stop until they're caught and that the timeline between their murders gets narrower and narrower as their kill count increases. So are there other victims buried on these moors? Certainly other children went missing whilst the moors murderers were active in the mid-1960s. And there's an unaccounted for lull in the killing spree. Their first victim, Pauline Reed, was murdered in July 1963. John Kilbride four months later, in November of the same year. Keith Bennett was killed in June 1964, six months after John. Leslie Ann Downey, just over six months after that. Then, there's a gap of nearly 10 months between the murders of Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans. What were Brady and Hindley doing in that time? You know, we knew that other children had gone missing in that area, but no one had actually tied him to them. And so one of my tasks was to try and find out if he would confirm that there were other victims. I reached the conclusion that there are other victims of the Moors murderers. Brady clearly intimated to me that there were such victims. I cannot now prove it. But nonetheless, I am satisfied that we still do not know the full extent of the killings executed by his little killing cult. One witness believes he saw Hindley and Brady on the moors during those 10 months. In the spring of 1965, Eric Marsden and his family stopped for a picnic in a lay-by on the A628 that crosses the South Pennine Hills, when they were struck by the strange behavior of a man and a woman. Where that fence dips down in the middle, that is where the lay bar used to be, and where we were sat in the car. And this car came over the hill behind us and pulled up on the opposite side. The gentleman who was driving got out and uh, opened up the boot and the lady who was with him got out, changed the shoes and he gave her a spade when she walked at back of the car and she carried the spade while he lifted a bundle out of the car and she closed the boot because he had his arms fastened around the bundle and then they walked up the hill and then they disappeared over the top 
and was gone about five to six minutes, that's all. Eric and his family watched the couple go over the hill in all three times. The last time they were gone for about 10 minutes. They watched as the couple got back in the car. He did a U-turn in the road and drew slowly up to the side of our car. She won her window down, did my Rindley, and she just leant out of the window and looked Margaret straight in the face and she says, you effing nosy bastards, have you seen enough? And then she leant back in and said, Ian, drive on. Many years later, in 1985, Eric made a formal statement to Manchester CID of what he had seen. And he just wouldn't accept my story or believe it at all, because he said Ian Brady can't drive. There's no way would he believe that Ian Brady could drive. I said Ian Brady can drive. I've seen him. Brady was known to ride a motorcycle, but did not hold a driving licence. However, Eric is convinced it was Brady he saw driving. We thought there was just burying rubbish at the time. We hadn't a clue what there was burying. But it just did look strange coming over 20 miles from Manchester over here to bury rubbish. The police told Eric to go home and forget about it. But he has no doubts about whom and what he saw that day. And it was definitely Ian Brady that was Definitely driving. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, yes, definitely. I put my life on that. But has too much time passed to find out today if there are yet more victims of the Moors murderers? <laughs> Decades after Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were sentenced to life imprisonment, the search still goes on for the bodies of Keith Bennett and other missing children from the mid-1960s who've never been accounted for. I will never give up, never in a month or Sunday. If it takes me to my grave, I'll carry on till then. It's these mounds are throwing us out a metre. Davy Jones and colleagues from the International Rescue Centre in Wales are conducting their own investigations based on Eric Marsden's witness statement. They're focusing their current search for other potential victims near the lay-by where Eric believes he saw Hindley and Brady carrying bundles from their car. With experience finding bodies after wars and natural disasters, Davy is undaunted looking for ones hidden for decades. We have markers pasted out with compass and GPS. So we've put the high priority area as these couple of grids. They'll be probed every half metre. So that means there's 840 probe holes in each square ready for the dogs. We've had bodies 15 feet down. In water, we've had it down to 50, 60 feet. Find it. Yeah. They've had bodies that have been buried 40 years, so it's, it's pretty good. Brady was last seen on these moors trying, he claimed, to locate the graves of Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett in 1987. The police returned to the search area a further six times between 2003 and 2009. But as yet, no new evidence has been found. Brady had previously told Keith Bennett's mother, Winnie Johnson, that he knew to within 20 metres where her son was buried. But, in return for revealing this information, he made unrealistic demands, including a day as a free man with alcohol, as well as being given the freedom to kill himself if he so chose. And so Keith's final resting place may never be found. At Wessenden Head, on the anniversary of what would have been her son's 60th birthday, Winnie Johnson left a last wreath in the area where she believed Keith's body lies. Four weeks later, in August 2012, she died of cancer. After almost 50 years of fighting for justice, Winnie had never given up hope. 
She begged his killers for peace of mind, and she set up funds so that the search for Keith could carry on after her death. That search continues. Before Brady's death, I asked Dr. Chris Cowley why he thought Brady always refused to reveal where Keith's body lay. Just say he did manage to successfully locate what's left of Keith Bennett. Then that's it, that's all over for Brady. He's got no more currency. He's like a gambler who's bet everything now, and that's like his last chip. Once he throws the dice one last time, it's all over. And he's got, he's got no bargaining power anymore. In December 2011, Brady won his appeal for a public mental health tribunal to rule on his sanity. He said he wanted to go back into the prison system where he might carry on his hunger strike without being force-fed. He wanted, he said, to die. But many felt he did not have the right. Well, let him have what he wants. Just, no. If you're suffering hanging on like that, let him hang on. He did it to the others. He made them suffer. Because you not only got the victim, it's the families, the relatives, it all down the line, they all suffered. I found it difficult to accept that someone as resourceful and manipulative as Brady, our philosopher serial killer, couldn't have taken his own life if he had really wanted to kill himself. He's certainly got the, the intelligence to work out a way of doing it. I mean, it's not rocket science. He had shoes with shoelaces on. He could make a noose hang himself. He had bed sheets he could tear into. You know. So why doesn't he do that? I think he's too scared. Um, he, 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 he wants to die because he's so miserable and depressed. I mean, if anyone watching this thinks he's having a, a cushy time in, in a mental hospital, just forget it. It's, it's a nightmarish place to be. Um, so he definitely wants to be out of it. Um, but he doesn't want to do it himself. I know maybe he hasn't got the guts. A week before his public tribunal was to consider his case, in August 2012, Brady had a seizure, fell and hurt his back. The hearing was postponed and Brady died before it could reconvene. People sometimes try to determine Brady's humanity by asking him to show remorse. In my experience, serial killers never show remorse. They can't. They enjoy what they do. And sadly, Brady, like most serial killers, liked to control and kill. Chris Cowley told me how Brady had reacted to the suggestion of remorse when he was alive. As far as I could gather, he understands the concept of remorse as it applies to his own circumstances. So he's very remorseful because of the absolute shambles that, that he made of his life by murdering and getting caught, you know. But it's the getting caught that's the, that's the remorse rather than the actual killing. Talking to somebody who is so alien, so devoid of compassion, you just can't see things from any sort of moral perspective at all. And there's no reason why we should expect him to show remorse for his crimes because his moral perspective is he never did anything wrong. What Brady and Hindley did to those children is so abominable that no one will or should forget them. But what can be learned from such senseless killing? In the end, it's the bravery of all the family and friends of Brady's victims in the face of such appalling murders that offers us an answer. One of the heartening things about this whole story is uh, the way the mothers would not allow their children to be forgotten, both Pauline Reed's mother and Winnie Johnson hung on against the odds, pushing all the time to try and get Brady and Hindley to finally disclose what happened to the children. Winnie Johnson, unfortunately, never did have the satisfaction of reburying her son, but we should remember those mothers for the remarkable people they were. Ordinary mothers whose children were snatched from the street, uh, but they would not forget their children. <laughs>